in making the record is just all it's all in the process and being in love with the process and I, I think that's something I've gotten significantly better at over the course of my career. If I have a day in the studio, I mean, that's a good day. You're living the dream, right? So it's sort of like, for me, uh, just taking my time a bit more and enjoying that, the making of, uh, looking at it, you know, cliche, but journey, not destination, you know? Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Release Day Series podcast. I'm your host, Alex Heward, and what a month to celebrate. Celebrate communities, celebrate diversity, celebrate culture. It's the month of June, and today, June 21st, is actually Indigenous Peoples Day here in Canada, and it's wonderful to just have this opportunity to really focus in and 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 recognize communities and, and culture and diversity within our world and of course june is also pride month so that is awesome to see so many supporters and so many great you know pieces great great pieces of media just great things to, to learn about and to read about and um and to celebrate this month the month of june a couple days ago it's, it's june 21st i should add today it's summer solstice as i mentioned uh, indigenous people's day and uh, a couple days ago with juneteenth celebrating the emancipation of slavery of the african americans and you know it's just it's it, it goes beyond one month in my mind and and i try as often as I can to educate, to really keep myself aware of, of what's happening with, you know, especially the LGBTQ plus community as well beyond this month, because uh, there's just so much uh, still adversity and discrimination that that happens for all of these communities that, uh, you know, this month is a great opportunity to, to shine a light on them, but it's also a great opportunity to just begin your journey or as a reminder to keep your journey uh, of education and understanding and support going so uh, love the month of June uh, there's so many great also just um, uh, movies TV shows videos uh, just things that come out to go along with this month that uh, help kickstart your education or keep your education as I said as I said going so uh, what a great month to celebrate diversity and inclusion and culture just around the world well today I am joined by uh, an absolutely amazing artist, singer, songwriter, composer, producer, filmmaker, Ian Foster. He is also a uh, Music Newfoundland and uh, East Coast Music Award winner for his work and just a fantastic human, amazing songwriter, great composer, and he has put out a new project called Close to the Bone that came out March 29th, 2023. And not only is it an album, but it's also a short film. And it is an incredibly cool project that we dive into. We dive into the production of it, of the of the album, of the the short film, uh, how he got involved with film festivals. We touch on one of his songs, Voyager, uh, quite heavily. This was one, maybe even my favorite song on the album. It has an incredible music video, an incredible story behind it, and there's an amazing relationship that he formed uh, following the release of this album due to the content of of the song and we also talked actually about how he wrote this song and what the inspiration was and uh ian is just an incredible speaker he he goes into some great detail i don't think you're going to take a lot away from this one of the other things he did for this project was he did like an, an art installation and he talks about what they did for that so it's a really cool episode to just generate some really cool creative ideas for multiple marketing mediums essentially so i hope you really enjoy this conversation we have a lot of fun uh, as you'll hear off the top we had been trying to play in this chat for a while so i'm really glad that it happened and that you are able to hear it today remember you can find all of our previous episodes on our website releasedayseries.com you can also find the limited video series on there and don't forget to sign up for our email newsletter that comes out weekly or bi-weekly or really whenever it's ready but the whole point is that you never miss an episode when it drops so broadcasting from the traditional territory of the williams treaties first nations the mississaugas of the credit the anishinaabe the chippewa the haudenosaunee wendat inuit and metis peoples here is my conversation with ian foster
Oh, Ian Foster, uh, welcome to the Release Day Series podcast, man. We've been talking. We were just talking. We've been laughing. Uh, we, <laughs> we, I, you and I connected in April of 2022, and you sent me your your video for Voyager, and we've been talking ever since. Uh, how you doing, man? It's been. It's been I'm doing journey. good. That's usually how I like to do uh, press. I like to reach out and say, yeah. when we talk <laughs> in a couple of years from now. <laughs> Uh, we'll have a great chat. <laughs> no, I'm. Uh, it just makes it all the sweeter to finally be on. You, you can. We kind of have a little thing in common. You started a podcast as well, eh? 2019. You, you had one going on. I did. It was called uh, yeah. If and When, uh, and cool. uh, conversations with creators about why they do what they do. And uh, it was a lot of. Nice. Um, yeah, it was a lot of. Uh, 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 all people that I knew somehow had some previous. Uh, relationship with and that I think that just made it easier for me and maybe for them too but definitely for me like in terms of getting this going you know it well it's like just having that initial history with them and it was a lot of Newfoundland artists at the time with a couple of other uh, we had Christina Martin on from Nova Scotia a good friend of mine um, but uh, yeah it was uh, it was a really fun experience I, I love the long form podcast I feel like um, it's the antidote to the current um uh, moment we find ourselves in where everything is like a 30 second clip, you know, uh, to me, like the podcasts are like a vinyl record or something like you, you, you spin it, you know, you, you do the whole thing. And, uh, I was on tour actually at the time, I think years before when I first got into podcasts, probably almost 10 years ago now. And, uh, just, just those long drives being, you know, accompanied by good conversation, uh, as a solo artist, it was a godsend. Yeah, and you hear that, and you're like, "Man, that'd be that'd be so fun to do." And, yeah, and it really, it really is. You've been doing this for a long time, man. You've been you've been in you've been in the music the music business for for a while, then. Yeah, well, I started in 2003. I finished my English and history degree and said, "Not going to use that," and tossed it in the garbage. Uh, no. <laughs> so the next I mean, logical step was to get into the music business. <laughs> well, the logical step after you get an English degree is what I did, which was go work for chapters for minimum wage for. Oh, a there year. you go. You know, I mean, there's books there. Um, yeah. most people just want to buy like, you know, the South beach diet was popular at the time. That was the main book okay. people were buying. It seemed it wasn't deep literature, right. but, uh, nevertheless, Four hour uh, work week. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, it was, uh, uh, that's, you know, I, I basically, you know, got a job and started gigging in, in locally and, and eventually put together a band and, and made the first record it took a few years. And then from there it sort of continued on. Um, but yeah, about 20 years, I think, uh, this year, actually 20 years this year. So what did you, what did you start out with? What kind of music were you playing when you first got started? Um, it was, well, the first record was more of a rock record and it was, um, it was a full band, um, uh, excellent band named the Ian Foster band. Very creative. Um, right. That's, that's killer. It was the classic band name where you're like, we'll just call it this for now till we come up with something better. And then we never did, you know? But it, I guess it was the age, roughly, of Matthew Goodband and Dave Matthews. There was a lot of that going on at the time. So, you know, it felt okay, I guess. But um, anyway, that was an all-for-one, one-for-all, you know, um, everybody making the equal contributions. And, and so we finished that record, and it was like every first record. It was, you know, epic and long and eking it out and after hours and studios and, like, all that stuff, the classic band stuff that you do to get a record made. And then after that, I started going on the road, and the band just wasn't prepared to do that. Um, like, the members had other commitments with family and stuff, so I basically started my solo career with that band record, which was kind of strange, but nevertheless, you know, it led to other <laughs> stuff, and then put out my, my own solo record, my first solo record, like, two years later, which I think was 2007 or eight. yeah. Wild. So you have you had a bit of an evolution as well in your in your sound or in the way that you've oh, been approaching music? I believe like I've I've had that with every record, you know, to some extent, big and small. Um and certainly from like I mean that band record feels unrecognizable now, as it should be. I think it would be a total tragedy if I was like, guess what? Stay same stuff <laughs> for eight, twenty years. That would be terrible. And and for me, um, so much of uh, the artists that I admire the most, you know, like um, Daniel Lenoir, Brian Eno, or David Byrne, or, you know, these are people who've always, um, uh, they've always reinvented themselves, you know, and, uh, and it's really interesting um, uh, to look at, you know, some of, some of our idols, I guess, now are, are getting um, 
you know, they're getting up there. And so they have that full career to look back on. And the ones that still seem vital, I mean, even people like Dylan, you know, it's like he's still he's still touring. I think he's 82, maybe, something like that. Yeah. It's pretty wild, yeah. you know. Yeah. Uh, I saw him in concert a number of years ago. The same weekend I saw Leonard Cohen play, similar kind of Ooh. thing. Like it was a big weekend wow. in Newfoundland. We usually don't That's have a big weekend. two legends here the same weekend. But uh <laughs> Um, yeah, it was, uh, it was quite inspiring to see, uh, the vitality there. And I think it comes from embracing change and it comes from embracing new sounds and new directions and all that. So I've really tried to keep that over the years front and center, you know, of just, uh, if, if something is outside the norm for me musically, like I'll, I'll tend to like run towards it instead of away from it, you know? Mm, yeah. You know, I, I feel that way. I was actually just talking about this with a buddy of mine about Mumford and Sons mm. and how they changed, you know, they, they kind of evolved and, and, you know, they were the, the first real kind of mainstream folk rock band, in my opinion, you know, just being really getting it out there, really getting it to people and being like, this is for the masses, you know, totally. it, and that, and that was awesome. That first album was, was great. And then the second album came out, and you're kind of like, it's more of the same thing, but these guys are really good at melodies and, and writing, and so I'm going to run with it a little bit. But I, I felt like by the time I kind of got through that second album, I was like, eh, yeah, it's kind of the same thing. And then they came out with their third album, that Wilder Mind album, and it was like, no banjo. Right. It was like it was like no folk. It was, you know, really keys. And, and you're and, and I, I remember them getting flack like this isn't Mumford and Son. What's going on? You can't do that. But I'm like, did you really want a third album that was exactly the same from this band? Yeah, oh, well, like, damned right? if you do, damned if you don't. You know, for me, I've also had the added benefit of um, being a producer for other artists. And so that has been huge for exactly what we're talking about, because inevitably like you are now as an artist stepping into another artist's world and your job is not to make them sound like you, it's to make them, you know, fulfill their, their own sound. And so that, that is the challenge and the fun of that job and why I love doing that pretty much, you know, at the same level as working on my own stuff, because it's it's still working in the studio it's still developing music but you're getting a new perspective and inevitably like you know if you uh really wanted to uh waste a lot of time i guess you could listen to <laughs> all my records and uh and hear uh hear the hear those progressions even between records of like oh wow he made these records during this time and there's probably uh you know you could probably follow those threads through you know that's that's great, man. That's what it's all about. And I, and I don't know. I, I mean, there, there's probably nothing really more honest either than what you've just put out with close to the bone, Cl uh, honest and and new and, um, you know, really, really close and and personal to you. This is uh, this is a incredible film and album project that 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 you've done. Tell t talk to us about close to the bone. Your your new album. Thanks, Alex. Yeah, um, I. Uh... That was an interesting, almost like meditative exercise, you know, um, I don't know, uh, how much you're, you're into that world. Uh, but, uh, it, you know, it's sort of like when you're trying to meditate, it's like, as soon as you start to think, you know, you sort of lost, you sort of lost it. So you're like, I'm really trying to think about not thinking like there's a lot of like what it feels, <laughs> it feels like there's just layers you're, you're sort of feeling away or whatever. And I guess I got to this... five minutes, Ian, I got to five minutes in headspace. Yeah. I was like five minutes. That's, I, I was like, I got to try and get beyond five minutes. I never did, but I tried. Sorry to interrupt. Can, no, can, no, can not at all. Believe you know, me, I tr it's... I've tried. <laughs> yeah, it is hard. It is hard. And, uh, and like the observe your thoughts thing. And I'm like, I'm observing. And then you're like on to what you're doing that night immediately. Like it's very <laughs> yeah. challenging. It's very, it's an on, it's a life work, let's face it. But, um, it sure is. yeah, I mean, for this record, there was an element of, of that, I suppose, in the sense that I really, um, as per what we were saying with the, the changing, changing things up, like I just was bored with what I was doing. So I was really trying different approaches. Like I wasn't picking up the acoustic guitar to write anything. I would be starting with like drum loops and sort of like more mood stuff. Like, uh, I do work as a composer for film as well. And so like I was pulling in probably some of those, those skills, those muscles, using those muscles to to sort of develop that way. And it was a deliberate effort to steer away from the traditional way of doing it and being like, 
not thinking about trying to write a personal album. This is why this is how I'm trying to link up this probably flimsy meditation analogy I'm building here. But <laughs> but it's like I was really trying to to uh, I wasn't trying to do that. And then I guess ironically, or as a, as a result of not trying, like I think it actually ended up as a more personal product. I'd taken away that sort of. Um, that artistic pressure sometimes, you know, especially if you're writing about something personal, like it's, you know, you're obviously close to it, you know, and you can put a lot of, a lot of pressure on yourself or, or worry that like, is this actually conveying it exactly right? And so on and so forth. And, uh, there was just none of that. I guess I just created the space for myself to be, to be honest about what I was doing. Um, and then that, that, that came out, especially in the lyrics, of course, you know, that, that those stories that, Ultimately, it's it's a record about. Um, it's certainly not biographical, uh, but it's certainly inspired by um, my some stories my mother told me about growing up just a few streets from where I live now in St. John's. You know, the the, the circularity of life was a, that generational thing uh, was really interesting to me uh, as a concept, and 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 the stories, the more specific imagery. You know, she was caring for her mother who who suffered uh, from rheumatoid arthritis at a time where there was even less treatments than now, and so um, it was it was quite compelling. You know, she was uh, uh, you know probably a mid to late teenager when she was like carrying her mother up the stairs. You know, things like that, just really just like stories of resilience. You know, and uh, and very powerful imagery of the you know the roles of the mother and and the daughter swapped. Um, and so, yeah, I just felt like it was the right time to, to tell that part of, um, to tell that part of that family story, which is ultimately a story many have faced. And that's one of the beautiful things about art in general. And this project specifically is the number of people who, you know, suddenly are talking to you about like, Oh yeah, I've gone through that. And then the, the sort of the beauty of having some of those conversations, I've just gotten some really, gotten into some really nice conversations with with both friends and strangers about about this stuff so yeah as as you should i mean it's it is uh it's pretty it's it's heavy but to go back to you know quickly the instrumentation and the feeling that you brought to it i think is is perfect like i think i think if you came into telling this story um telling these stories you know or, or bringing this feeling to life playing a full band doesn't really feel like it's the right fit you know, so, you know, I could only imagine what you were maybe sitting there thinking this was, was this like a pandemic? Pro I hate to use the term, but was it a yeah. pandemic? Like, did it come to you? Was I that often yeah. say this is specifically not a pandemic project just to tell people just so that they're not like, okay, don't need to hear another song about how you're locked in the bedroom or whatever, you know? Um, no, and, that, and it's not even that, but I feel like we've all been left with opportunity to think, you know, like to, you, to your point, yeah. you're trying not to think about it, but you just have that opportunity or you have the opportunity to talk to people, you have the opportunity to really think, to be like, I want to explore something new, um, but that isn't what happened. So I'm not going to go much further on that. I should say, actually, that like the record was started about a year before the pandemic, but inevitably a bunch of it was made then. And there were challenges to the record and probably some benefits, um, if I'm honest, just that time obviously was weird. That's one thing we're all talking about, the, the nature of, you know, there's articles written about that, about how we all culturally and I guess globally felt time shift during the pandemic because everything, you know, seemed to stop and time seemed to reflect that. It was both fast and slow at the same time. Um, but I think that in the, in the bubble of this record, um, pandemic analogy, bubble, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, it gave myself, my co-producer, Mark Turner, that little bit of extra time. Like the, the downside was he lives in Toronto and couldn't be here. So it was a lot of this mm -hmm. Zoom esque you know yeah. type chats um but uh but he's also a friend and was b before the record was made so the process we embarked on was me sort of sending him ideas like and i really got into this and i'm still doing it today actually with a film project i'm working right right now with a director who's open to it i'm just sort of throwing ideas at them throwing them at the wall seeing what sticks i find it an incredibly liberating uh way to work uh especially when i think Artists can be really sensitive about their work, you know, and really hold on to it tightly. I've definitely been that artist, you know, like resisting, like, you know, change once you get to the studio and all of that stuff. But I find that going in the other direction is just so fun. It's so free flow. It's like, okay, this is a cool idea. This is not like you can let things fight it out in the, in the, 
in the boxing ring of opportunities, you know, and ideas and, uh, and it can really yield some special work. And it's just really fun to work that way. You sort of are open to, to everything. Um, and I, I did that a lot with Mark um, in his role as co-producer for the record. So I'd throw ideas at him. We'd have these long chats. He'd write me these long messages. It was not a conventional co-producing situation, I don't think. It, it, was, it was more of an extended dialogue and really about iteration, I think. You know, taking an idea and going, okay, let's iterate on this a little. Let's let it sit for a little while. And I think as a result of that, that's that's feeding into like, you know, I guess your your point as well. Like it it just sort of uh, it evolves so organically and over such a long period of time that uh, some of those traps you could have fallen into of being really like deliberate about something like that all just yeah. sort of washed away in that process. Yeah, that's huge. That's huge. Being able to have somebody to do that with. I mean, whether it's whether it's current producer or a friend or or another artist, bouncing ideas. It is incredibly liberating and and I think a huge part of being able to get to really what your your intent is I mean there's there's a point where it's got to stop where you have to be deliberate where you have to say okay we've we've done this we've gotten to where we, we've said no enough times I think we've arrived at where we're at and we're ready to move forward but that but that process is I mean I, I work in my full-time job creatively with a great creative team and that's part of what we do is we I, I set up these calls to be like look I just want to talk things out I want to you know it's okay if it sucks it's okay if it you know but but this is in my head you know and Ed Sheeran says it best too right like right to get all that crap out like bounce the ideas off to get out the garbage and get to where you know you you are intentionally needing to go and deliberately needing to go and you'll you'll end up at a point where you feel like yeah okay we're here you might even experience this moment of where what am i doing where am i supposed to go how is this going to come together lord knows i've felt that way with many a project i don't think you i think that's a moment in every project i don't think i've ever worked on a project where i haven't thought like is this any good? Like, I think that's a, that's a good sign when you're asking the question, you know, it's more of just a quality check than, than serious existential doubt. I think, you know, is that you should be checking in with yourself. Um, as long as you don't let it, you know, crush you, you're okay. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, I, as I'm listening to this album, you know, like I, I, I you know, it's been kind of referenced some like eighties sort of synth pop feel to it as well. But you know, I, I get bleachers. You, you, you know, you know, the band bleachers. Oh, with, I've uh, heard, I've heard all the bleachers. I probably heard a little bit, but it's not, it's not a direct influence for sure. Oh man. It's, uh, you know, and I, and I don't mean to say that's what it's, you know, it just, it's great. There is a great back. Jack, Jack Antonoff, Antonoff, uh, works a lot with Taylor Swift, um, oh, that yeah. and explosions in the sky. Like you've got it, you've got a great, sound again accompanying really these these pretty these heavy songs and uh, and one song i'd love to just talk about and it came out pretty maybe even your first single was voyager yeah. and that was what you had sent to me and the music video is incredible it's a great animated piece and you know sort of this 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 growing up, right? It's this, it's this, this growing up between father and, and son. If I can, if I remember correctly, I watched it a while ago, but I just remember having this feeling watching it where I was like, man, like I, I've got a couple sons now. And then just like, this is, this is so great. Talk to me about sort of this underlying, the, the underlying message with, with this, this song, because the music video is kind of, I think intended to be about Voyager in space, but I, I get a few different feelings from it. So I'd, I'd love to hear directly from you what Voyager is all about. Right. Um, yeah. So the, the story of writing the song came from the BAM Center in Alberta. Um, I was out there um, for a songwriter residency program. And that's such a cool situation and setup. You know, they give you this little hut. It's very rustic. It has a piano in it that's tuned up and all the gear you could want. And you just sit there in the woods and watch deer walk by and write songs. I mean, it's kind of like, you know. And they, you know, they have restaurants and stuff. So you get the rural, like chilled out feel and you get to also eat regularly. So it's great. <laughs> <laughs> they have That's it awesome. all set up to basically be like, we've taken care of everything and your job is to, you know, your mm -hmm. job is to just work on what you're doing. So I was reading at the time, I guess, the paper and um, was reading about the Voyager passing um into interstellar space or the space between the stars. And that was uh, worded that way in the NASA press release. And I thought that was quite poetic. And, I, and I've made this joke on stage at shows where I say, if you want some insight into the genius of songwriting, 
just know that I read that and then opened the notes file on my phone and wrote the space between the stars, write song about space probe. That was my deep, <laughs> thoughtful, artistic note to, to prophetic, self, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah, basically done, you know? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, um, uh, I, I think maybe I, I guess I read that before and then I was sort of going back through ideas when I was at the BAM Center. And one of the things that that struck me about it um, at the time, and this I think really made it into the song, uh, is that uh, that story in whatever I read at The Guardian or The, the Times or whatever um, was like story number 10 that day. Like there were nine or so more important stories in the world. And it was all the usual bullshit we read in the paper every day. But somehow this furthest flung object ever made by humankind into our universe that has been telling us who we are in, in fundamental ways. I mean, the famous blue dot picture, like all this stuff, you know, uh, that wasn't as important. And, uh, you know, it seemed like that was quite a, in the macro, I guess, like that idea, right. That, that, you know, we're in such a strange time of, of disconnect and there was something so beautiful about this, that we came together and made this thing that, has given us so much information as, as a species, uh, is, is really special. It's very pro science, of course, and all that stuff too. So I wrote the song and, uh, have been playing it at shows for years before I even recorded it. It's, it's probably the oldest song actually on close to the bone. Um, and, uh, and it's definitely a special song. Like it's, I've definitely had special relationships with audiences via that song. So I'm, I'm pretty grateful for its existence. Um, when it came time to make the video, um, I, I was, I worked with this, uh, director, Andrew Winter and, uh, Mira Howards, uh, was the, the, uh, the illustrator for the video. Um, and I basically co-wrote the story, uh, with, with Andrew. Um, and I was researching for it. We were trying to figure out exactly how to hang. Andrew had ideas for the actual like space animations and how to approach it visually. Uh, but we were looking for that story to hang the video on, you know, we didn't just want it to be. Um, space images that that feels like it would have just been you know pretty basic um, and I came across this incredible uh, story about the makers of the Voyager um, and and again it was like this this long form journalism piece um, had some really amazing little nuggets of information like one of the um, uh, one of the engineers uh, when he went to the jet propulsion laboratory he had crossed a few states from his home state and that's the furthest he'd ever traveled in his life. He had never, he had never, you know, traveled abroad or anything like that. I thought that was an amazing juxtaposition, which is sort of featured in the video. You know, it's a little esoteric, of course, but like sort of the car driving across the desert, you know, uh, contrasted with, you know, the Voyager drifting through space, this furthest flung object. And here's a guy who, you know, just did a, his interstate journey was his biggest journey he'd ever made, you know, uh, to build this thing. And, uh, and there's also cool stuff like, you know, the engineers are now retiring because they're, you know, they're obviously quite, quite elderly at this point. The people who originally built the Voyager in the prime of their career um, back in the 70s. Uh, and, and they're hiring like amazing MIT grads who are like, how do you work this gear? Because all the gear is dated from the 70s. So it's like, you know, Star Trek the original enterprise, like it's buttons <laughs> and dials and yeah. things, you know, yeah. instead of like touch screens. And I thought yeah. that was all just really fascinating and that sort of passage of time and stuff. So, so we sort of made it as a little tribute, I guess, to, to that article and what we read about, you know, the real humans behind this thing that they figured might last three or four years or seven years at most. And it's now middle-aged out there in the universe and still, still has a little bit of juice in it somehow, even though it's, exponentially uh, less powerful than even the phone uh, that's in my pocket. You know, it's pretty wild. That's, that's so cool because you could like, I get, see the, the whole chorus is, you know, just keep talking, you know, and, uh, it, and it just, it based, you know, on what I had known about the album and uh, from the, the short film, which we're, we're going to get to, it just, it, it felt like, you know, if I didn't see the video, it felt very much like this, um, this relationship between, young and old which which it is but it, but it, but in a familial sense you know it's like you know we want you're older you know more we want you to keep talking to us and keep you know educating us and keep passing on your knowledge to us and then even when they pass on it's like just keep talking you know like what else are you sending me what else can we get from you and and that was something that 
it just it just hit me in in that way and when we talk about again sort of the greater idea of close to the bone being you know with caring for people and, and mostly you know your, your song pre-existing condition but feeling like this uh you know, caring for older people. And as we get older with age, you know, you talk about it uh, being about identity and, and in mourning periods and this time when, you know, you, you feel change in your, in your life. And yeah, it just, it was so cool to see the video and then listen to it in the context of the album just hit me in a, in a whole different way. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. I do feel like that song um, probably more than most, like I agree with you. It's, it's probably most open to interpretation. I guess a bunch of them are, but but that one I've experienced it. You know, I've played it. Like I said, yeah. it was one of the older songs on the record. Um, yeah, and uh, it's okay to be drinking coffee here, right? This is that casual. Like, of course, I feel like yeah, we're man. Having, hey. having a nice little coffee day. Hey, here. Cheers, man. We go. should have brought these up earlier. Yeah, man. exactly. <laughs> Where's my release okay. day yeah. coffee mug? Yeah. That's, isn't that the way? <laughs> All right. You heard it here, folks. We'll get it in. We'll get it in the works. We'll get it in the works. And if it fails, it's Ian's fault. Sorry. If I that shows up in my mail one day, I'll be like, <laughs> Alex is doing good. That's how I know. You know what, man? I, you can expect it. You can expect it. <laughs> I would All right? love that. It's going to happen. I would love it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, Oh, what was I talking about? Um, yeah. Oh, coffee, right. The uh, the different um, interpretations. You know, like obviously yes. playing it for audiences uh, <laughs> as as one of the oldest songs on the record. You you sort of um, you get more reaction. You've just played it for more people in a room with people. You know. Uh, but I've had people like there's a um, a friend of mine who is a, a minister. He's like, I think the song's about God. You know. And I'm like, you would think that, you know, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, of course. yeah, but of course it's the cosmos. It's the great, you know, like it's yeah. all, it, it makes sense. Right. It, it's, yeah. uh, and, and like you said, there's that personal aspect, uh, of just, just keep talking. Of course it could be, you know, in, in the, in the literalness of the song, it's the idea that the Voyager is, you know, dying, it's powering down. We won't continue to receive messages from it. Um, but it, but it is ultimately what, it, it, you know, when I was telling you earlier about where this came from, the idea that that was story number 10 about the Voyager, you know, it's like the, the other nine stories are about us not talking, really. And I mean that like globally, right? There's so much division. We're so ready to cut each other off and cut each other down. Like we, we, uh, we're talking uh, in an age of like constant connection. We're talking, really talking less than ever, you know? So, um, yeah, yeah. We're talking too much without context too. I and mean, we're talking so much without, you know, it's funny. Everybody talks about it. You know, oh, you don't send that in an email because don't don't send that in a text message or, you know, oh, I took it wrong because you sent it as a text message. Well, that's literally how we're talking. That's how anybody is talking now. It's the reason you know? that even though I'm on it, like, and I, I'm not active at all, as you'll see if you visit it, but <laughs> Twitter, like I've never yeah. understood Twitter, you know, and I know it's it's co yeah. like right now it's popular to, to bitch about Twitter, but like. I just stepping back and looking at it as a platform, it's a platform that uh, up until, you know, a little while ago, it only had 180 characters. I think it's 240 now or whatever. Uh, it basically values declarative statements without context. I mean, what could go wrong? Yep. You know, and yeah. I mean, here we are <laughs> exactly. see, here seeing the results of that. It's like, you know, uh, it, it's just it, it's a it's a very antisocial social media, like more than the others. Here, here's the thing. I'm okay if you want to go out in there and make a statement, you know, but it's everybody else who reacts to it the way that they do, where you're like, why, like, why aren't we just more curious as to why this person feels this way instead of just throwing your feelings You've in there? You've got you it. Know? I mean, but for me, the, the, the example I've podcast given... podcast we're getting into, but... Say that again, sorry? <laughs> sorry, a, this is a whole other podcast Oh, I know, into, I know. Sorry, I'll, 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 you can cut this if you want, but, <laughs> yeah. uh, but you know, I mean, the day that I, I realized it just wasn't for me was the day that I read, like, my one of... A tweet that I was satisfied with where I was like, someone was talking about an issue, which is supposed to be Twitter too, right? Like, I kind of go to like the Onion, the Onion's Twitter, like the yeah. satirical, because like the headlines, yeah. it's just one liner jokes. Like, it's it excels at that as a platform. That's yes. fantastic. But like, um, it was someone saying like, let's unpack this one of 10, you know? And then two yeah. of 10, three of 10, four of 10. Yeah. And then like they all yeah. had different retweet numbers. Like number six was the most retweeted tweet of this 10 tweet thing. And I read all 10 was like, hey, look, somebody actually managed to get some context in there and some nuance. But they had to break yep. the nature of the platform really to to pull that off. right? Yeah. And that to me is the part that's like, OK, you know. 
Yeah, and there's actually a lot of that now, a lot of threads, just like part one of this thread and that thread. And so it's, uh, yeah, and, and just, just to wrap this up, actually, if you get Twitter blue, uh, you have as many characters, I'm pretty sure, as you want now. Wow. So, wow. It, like, if you if you subscribe, if you pay the monthly fee, yeah, you can just, you can just keep going. Wow. Anyways, <laughs> uh, <laughs> great song, man. Wouldn't it be I incredible if you were like, love it. if, if, cause you just said you worked at this creative company and you were like, by the way, it's Twitter that I work at. Thanks by the way, for, that's where for I work. bitching about That's it. where we bounce off yeah. ideas and, uh, they go nowhere. <laughs> yeah. No, <laughs> no, but honestly, Voyager. And, and I think that's, I think that's the, the, the signs of a really, really good song is being able to take that, being able to start from something like what you did with Voyager, the actual Voyager, and people can take that and, and liken it to anything that they want. So it's just just fantastic. And, and again, instrumentally, big fan of how the song the song comes together. And, and really, the, the the whole album it's very cohesive. It feels it feels like an album was was put together. Oh, that's good to hear. Yeah, and I, I'll actually just close off on Voyager uh, quickly by saying like a favorite moment in recent years for me came via that song and, and interpretations of it. I got this message from a uh, employee at the, the jet propulsion laboratory uh, at NASA who was, had heard the song and uh, was like passing it around the office and like reached out and we're like Facebook friends now, you know? And uh, I thought that was so cool. Like, that's definitely just a highlight of, you know, um, like, wow, people in that, you know, NASA are listening. Take me to space, you know, like, let's do yeah. this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you know, and if that's all, if they, you, we all have our own goals. But for me, I'm like, if that's all that happened for me, if that was the one person that I connected with, like, amazing. Totally. You know, and, and that's, that's, that's so great. You know, it, it did, its, uh, did its job, man. Wow. Uh, so you you're you now you also had a film close to the bone short film to accompany this album so you're also a filmmaker that's been happening for for quite a few years as well you've been li- lifelong filmmaker as well uh, about a decade uh i would say yeah. and and it grew out of basically scoring films i guess like um you know inevitably uh you know, you sort of, you make friends in the arts community and someone's making their first film and they're like, would you do this? You you know, music, you know, and of course it doesn't work like that, but it also does because how else do you learn, you know? So I started on some small, you know, just, oh yeah, that'd be fun to try and really enjoyed it. And then just have been growing that side of what I do um, for years, both as a composer, like I'm, I'm currently scoring my first feature documentary for the National Film Board, which is certainly a career highlight so far in that side of my, my career. Um, so I'm loving that work. Um, and then after a few years of, of composing and I guess seeing, seeing films in various stages of undress, you know, because it really does vary per project. You get stuff that's like basically done. And then you also get stuff that's like, you know, it's, it's not fully done at all. It's not colored. The final sound is not there. Sometimes they're still kind of working on the edit a bit or whatever. Um, and that, that was really like, that was sort of like a, a, a very cheap film school experience for me. Right. Because I got to see behind the scenes in a really hands-on direct way that I hadn't before. So I, and, and just all those conversations with directors who were also friends. So they'd be talking to me about the process and the crews and like all that stuff. So I was just kind of soaking in a bunch of that. And then inevitably at one point just decided to, you know, throw my hat in the ring and be like, well, I'm going to spend some money on coffee and sandwiches and call in some favors and friends and see if we can make a little movie. So I made my first short back in 20, was it 13, I think, or 12, something like that. It's called One More Song. And uh, it's based on a short story and a song that I, that I wrote uh, for my album, The Evening Light, uh, back in 2011. And, uh, and yeah, it was about a 10 minute ish film and uh, it won a couple of awards and got licensed to CBC. And that was pretty amazing for a first film. Um, and that afforded me the opportunity to get into the Pitcher Start program, which is a program here in Newfoundland uh, that's basically like a, a bigger training program. They give you like a, a fairly large budget for a short because shorts are usually made on pretty much nothing. Uh, but you get a full crew and you get the full experience. And it's basically like a program made to go, OK, you know, if you multiplied this by 10, this will be how a feature is made. You get three days of shooting, but it's a full crew and blah, 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 blah. So, uh, so that was a really good experience as well. That did a couple of great things. It was called Keystone. Uh, and I guess this is technically my third 
film, like short narrative fiction film, though I've done some music videos and stuff for other people. So, um, so yeah, it's been a little um, side project that's just been been ticketing along in my life side career. I don't know what you would call it, but it's, it's uh, yeah. certainly the passion side of it a little bit more. Uh, but it's something that I just, I want to keep doing and keep growing that as well, because I, I, I love it. And I love this sort of uh, kind of messed up uh, director composer relationship, you know, obviously close yeah. to the bone <laughs> is like the ultimate throwing your head in the ring of like the whole project is sort of based on that of like, it's, it's this uh, truly, uh, synergistic it's both an album and a film and they both inform each other and yeah yeah it's uh it, it's great it's great great companion great companion piece i gotta i gotta ask the question did you get funding to do this because i mean it's it's one thing to build to make an album and and to put you know what you need to into creating an album and then you're gonna do a short film on top of this how how did you make all that work uh, funding is the short nice <laughs> answer for sure. Uh, yeah. Certainly, I would uh, I would have uh, abused a lot of people's time if I didn't have funding because it takes a village yeah. to make stuff like this, uh, and you need to need to be able to pay them. Um, and God knows it's not through record sales. In case you haven't noticed, through right. other artists you've been talking to. Uh, <laughs> yep, so unfortunately, uh, so yeah, so it's uh, I was lucky, and I mean to be honest with you that. That's basically the journey of every film, you know, um, and that was something that I learned from Picture Start because I did, you know, I went went through some of the funding bodies I had with that program. But, you know, uh, th that's uh, truly in the film world. I mean, in every world, but like film is just so expensive, you know, I mean, you could make, yeah. you know, 10 albums for the cost of one film usually, you know, so um, so so much of that and the time when you hear about movies taking years like usually a couple of those years are just getting the money together, you know, and finding yeah. the right sources for it. Um, so, uh, so yeah, that's, that's the sort of challenge there, but you know, that's all, that's all a piece of it, of course. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's, and there's been great, so you, it sounds like you've had really a, a incredible success with what you, with what you do, because even with this, I mean, this short film came out before the album and played at film festivals. Yeah. And that was sort of, uh, a decision by me and this my little team of people to sort of be like, um, you know, what can we do with this that's just different and and you know embrace the the weirdness of the project, I guess, like just in the sense that it's not a conventional you know album, um, which I'm really excited about because God knows like man releases album is not much of a news story, uh, so <laughs> you know uh, it's fun to just do something different with it. And we were like, well, film festivals, you know, are a route. Uh, definitely was a risk, you know, um, because it's a longer film in terms of the short film world. Like a short film is usually like five to 10 minutes is kind of the ideal time frame. This is 22. Uh, it's ultimately a silent film where music is telling the story. So it's a different kind of like, you know, it could be perceived as a series of music videos, even though it's not that. So uh, yeah, there was sort of like, it's funny how people go, that's such a cool project. That's great. That must be awesome. And you're like, it is, but it's a double-edged sword because the weirder the thing is, and by weird, I mean, I'm being relative, of course, you know, just weird in terms of what I'm saying, like length and format and stuff, you know, you're, you're, you're really hoping to slip into a niche that you hope is out there somewhere. Like you hope that a festival looks at it and goes, this fits because we have a music theme this year or something like that. Uh, and there's like, you know, you don't make it thinking about that because that's right. too arbitrary. You just kind of make it and then yeah. cross your fingers that somebody wants it. Length of time too, right? I mean, there, there, it's like, it's like if you're, if your documentary or project or something isn't between six minutes and an hour and a half or, or if it's, if it, if it is six minutes or it's an hour and a half, then it qualifies. Like you got a 22 minute, 20 minute ish project here. There's not a whole lot of film festivals that are like we're looking for a twenty yeah. to thirty, which I think is your your, your point. That here is my as point. Well, yeah, because, and and, yeah. and there was a bunch it just wasn't eligible for as a result. Like it'd be like up to yeah. twenty minutes, and you're like, okay, or up to fifteen minutes or yeah. whatever. Yeah, and even the ones that are, I mean, you really do. There's a lot of bitter musicians out there, a lot of bitter artists, but you have to <laughs> the, the the antidote to bitterness is to try to to look at it from the other perspective, realistically, yep. not just in an emotional way, which is so easy to slip into, you know, <laughs> with rejection yeah. or whatever. But you sort of go yeah. like a 22 minute film would be like four other films, right? So yeah. like, yeah. you know, is it four times better than any one of those films? You know, um, right. 
Uh, and not that it's just about better, but you know what I mean? Like it's it's that thing where mm-hmm. a festival has to go, we want to program the most people possible to give the most people yeah. an opportunity. Um, and so – Or to make know, the most money. Yeah. Or to make the most money off of submissions, right? I don't know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Could well, we can go, that, oh, you want but... to go the bitter route. Let's yeah. do this. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I, I did the same thing, man. I, I had a documentary we did in 2016 that we, we put out. It was about just over an hour long, and it was about uh, a hip-hop artist in Toronto and him sort of going through the creation of his latest album and really feeling like he wasn't motivated anymore because of the way that the music world and the way that art really has been going, which is just to you know, overconsumption to this uh the point where if you're not dropping an album or something every two weeks, or if you, if you go through so much time to put an album together, then, you know, a week later people have moved on. And it's like, what's, you know, that's the bitter angle. He's like, what's the point of this, you know? And like, that was kind of what he went through. And so I, um, and that was what it was kind of all about was sort of essentially what a lot of artists are facing. And we got into one, we got into one festival in Toronto, yeah. you know, the Toronto indie film festival, but otherwise it was, yeah, it was just, no, nope, the rejection nope, rate nope. of film festivals is wild. I would probably place yeah. it at roughly 20 to one, you know? Uh, and yeah, that's, wow. that's okay. through experiences of <laughs> directors that I could name that you would know and have heard of that are in major movies and they make a film and, it gets into one out of 20 festivals. Like it's pretty insane. So what, what's, what's kind of the next steps for you then? I, I also saw you did actually, um, I'll interrupt my own thought there for a second and uh, an audio visual installation as well for the, uh, yeah, for the film. yeah, yeah. That's, that was that's, another, that's, you know, really again, cool. this, this whole project has been and, and continues to be, you know, it's so funny when a record comes out, like we, we often work towards the record and go, and now it's out done. And you're like, that's a weird place to end when you're like, this is the first time people can actually finally hear it, you know, so it, it's constantly yeah. this whole project, whether it's the film festival route or the installation route, we'll talk about now. It's like it's always just like, what new way can we find to engage people with this? Because you know, God knows, like streaming is what it is, and I don't even just mean money, which is usually the conversation, but but just the discoverability, you know, involved in that and the challenges there. So. Um, so yeah, the installation was basically taking the film and, and breaking it out into, uh, its parts and, and projecting those parts in a public space. In this case, the Cornerbrook public library in Newfoundland. And, uh, and so we had some, some team members, I think from Grenfell and other stuff who, who kind of built little mini sets, like, like would, you know, sort of cool. decorate just a few little, like make it look vaguely kitchen, like with some drapes and stuff for right. the kitchen scene, you know, and we would use that part, like the, the middle distance section of the film, um, we would show there and then they would move through like a walking kind of exhibit and they would see the dance sequence projected downwards onto the floor and would watch it like, you know, in this large atrium space that sort of mimicked the large space in the film for the pre-existing condition segment. So it was a really interesting and interactive thing. I will say there were some problems that that led to a kind of a funny story, which was that we arrived there and the Cornerbrook Public Library, like it's a fringe festival, CB Nui, beautiful festival that's like a nighttime walking festival, basically, uh, in September in, in Cornerbrook. And so the day they went in to set up, we're like, well, we have all day. This is great. And so we are getting set up. And, you know, again, there was a team that the festival had to set up. And we had done all the, the tech checks before. And we uh, had all these projectors rented. And we set them all up. And uh, everything was working. It was looking good. You know, it's September, so still early in the fall. It doesn't get dark till you know, maybe like 6.30, 7 o'clock. And the festival starts, I think, at 9 or 10. And, uh, and then as it gets dark, all of the lights come on inside the library. And it turns out (laughs) that like the library was on like sensors for like the, the, and and the library is never open in the evening. So the people were not prepared, like staff had even gone home. And then we called a staff member in and they're like, uh, and this is classic. Like I'm sure it's, it's, you know. There's a lot of cities like this. The library in this case was like attached to the city hall and it was all on a grid controlled from city hall. Like the library actually (laughs) didn't have the ability to affect the lighting at all. So we're standing in a fully lit up library about an hour (laughs) before people are supposed to come in and it's projector based. So you can't see anything because the lights are on and we're like, what are we going to do? 
And this is so small town perfect that there's the mayor of Cornerbrook is this guy named Jim Parsons. And I, um, I, he used to run before he was mayor, he used to run a music venue that I had played a bunch of times. And so I knew him and still had his contact in my phone. So I called his cell phone and I was like, Mr. Mayor, I'm just wondering if you can come down and turn off the lights at this library for me. <laughs> so I just called the mayor that's and asked awesome. him to come down and turn off the there lights. There you go. That's all. You know, that's, that's all it takes. So small town. And I felt pretty so great in that moment. Story. I have to say that I was like, maybe this yeah. is, maybe there's something to this influencer thing. I yeah. don't know. Save the day. Yeah. <laughs> that's wild, man. That's so cool. What it, would it get a great way to just bring keep the story alive and, and, uh, and moving it forward, man. That's, uh, that's so awesome. And, you know, you can just, I love to be able to talk about this kind of stuff and have, have those listening really just kind of take it as an idea as to what they can do. You know, it's, I know it's expensive and I know that it takes a lot to go and write a short film and you got, you gotta have the personality and the mindset like you do to, to really go out there and do it. But I mean, it's just, it's such a great, Avenue. So it's really cool what you've you've done for this album and the project. You you've taken this opportunity to explore these mediums and and just and bring it to people in different ways. It's it's so cool. Well, thanks, Alex. Yeah, I, I mean, I've said this to artists when I'm working with them as a producer, if they're like newer artists or whatever. Um, you know, where I'm like, you really just need to um, you need to make the record and then start the the promotional thought then you know um just in the sense that i certainly didn't know we'd do an installation necessarily that it would be in any film festivals like the routes to promote it and those different things like they're they're special too because i was getting i was really excited about that installation thing just because it was different again back to that theme of trying new things and also just like to see like i was kind of like no matter what happens with that, it was just an opportunity to see if that's a cool way to connect with people or not, whether it actually turned, it turned out good, but it's like, if, if it hadn't, it still would have been like, I'm glad we did that because I'd never run an installation like that before with, with video and that sort of thing and music. And so that was a really fun thing to experience. But of course, like in making the record, it's just all, it's all in the process process and being in love with the process. And I, I think that's something I've gotten significantly better at over the course of my career. You know, I think when you're younger, you're like, let's get the record out. You know, like, it's just really exciting. It's all about yeah. like, and there's all these deadlines we impose on ourselves, which like, <laughs> again, if you're not yeah. with like Sony, like what's the deadline? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like if it's not like a, right. like a million dollar record deal where they're like, we have to put this out. Yeah. Like we're all indie artists, especially in Canada. Like, I'm not sure there is a label that has that level of pressure on their artists. You know what I mean? That it's like, if it doesn't come out, everything will come crashing down tomorrow, you know? Um, so, but I, th and that can be a little, little existential. What does it all mean? Kind of thing. Or it can be like a gift, you know, it can be, uh, let's take the time, fall in love with the process, you know, spend the time in studio. Like when we were, you know, when we're kids and we're like dreaming about being a musician, like that's the thing you're actually dreaming about. You're not dreaming about like promotional tours, you know, you're not dreaming no. about press right. articles. I mean, maybe you are, but like, oh. it's, it's more about, <laughs> <No, you're... laughs> you know, can't wait to, you know, whatever, but it's just like, to, to me, it's, it's uh, just, if I have a day in the studio, I mean, that's a good day. You're living the dream, right? So it's sort of like, for me, uh, just taking my time a bit more and enjoying that, the making of, uh, looking at it, you know, cliche, but journey, not destination, you know? Amazing. Yeah. A hundred percent agree. Look, man, I think that's a great place to wrap it up. But, uh, one last thing I did want to ask, there is a photo of you on your Instagram with Mr. Gordon Lightfoot. And, and I want to know, what is he saying to you? What, like, what, what, was there one thing that you got that he was said that you were like, I'm going to keep doing this or, or wait, what, what, what is this conversation that you're having with, with, you know, unfortunately rest in peace of the great Gordon yes. Lightfoot. But, uh, I, I'd love to know the story of this image. Yeah. I think he was saying, um, where can you get a good burger? No. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I saw that one. Coming. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Give up Ian. It's not worth it. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. No, uh, that would be incredible. <laughs> we have photo of it, you know? Uh, no, yeah. I, um, I did this, this set, uh, when he was here, uh, at the arts and culture center years ago and, uh, at his show and got to meet him and 
and chat and go backstage and all that stuff. And I got to be honest, I don't, I know that's not romantic to say and maybe shocking, but I don't remember what specifically he said. I just remember it. it was, <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> it was, it was, it was definitely more small talky. I think it wasn't, it wasn't yeah. like a, a legendary piece of, uh, <laughs> which you it was know, like listening to you and he was like, Hey, I really like that song or, you know, Hey, keep doing what you're doing. No, it was just, it really was working at a bird. Yeah. I'm sure he said something like good job or whatever, but it was like, you yeah. know, it, uh, which, okay. you know, it's funny because sometimes people are disappointed <laughs> by that. And I think about it. And I'm like, I mean, what kind of, what kind of famous jerk would you have to be if you like met a stranger and you were like, here's some prime advice in like the 30 seconds yeah. you're talking to them. It's like, yeah. are you proselytizing? Like, what are you doing? You're just going yeah. around <laughs> presenting your wisdom to people. Randomly. Right. So no, he yeah. was like, but it was, it was, you know, it's all, it's that old saying of like, you might forget what they said, but not how they made you feel or whatever. Right. So it's like, he was, he was just a down to earth. He was a nice, nice guy, you know? And I mean, of course, you know, inevitably, I was a bit nervous because you're like, you know, it's a legend and it's definitely um, uh, it's one that's important to me, too. Right. In the sense that like uh, various summers like him and I was certainly count like Ron Hines here in Newfoundland. And, you know, there's certain people who like truly did pave the way more directly than others for the work that I've done in my career, largely um, that that sort of solo male singer, songwriter, storyteller, like these were the OG people to do that in the country, you know? So, uh, I, I think, you know, even if the style is completely different, anyone like me, like owes those people a debt of gratitude, you know? Um, so I was just happy that he wasn't a jerk really. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, hey man, and that's fair too. I mean, sometimes you get in those situations, you're just kind of like, I, I don't even know what's happening right now. I don't know what he's saying. I don't like, am I really here? So, exactly. uh, you know, I, I totally, I totally respect that as well. Well, Ian, it, close to the bone again, fantastic album, fantastic short film. Like we, we could keep going here. I mean, but I, I do want to say if you can go check out great dark wonders, uh, article on your pre existing condition, uh, single when that came out and check out that mu music video i mean check out everything around this but uh that was a great little article as well to, to give some background on on that song because it is a big part of the album that i i purposely didn't talk about because you can find this to talk about uh in, in a great uh publication like like great dark wonder and so yeah so please link, link to the the link to the short film the album are all in the notes and um man ian Thank you for taking the time, finally, for us to talk about your project on the Release Day Series podcast. Oh, thank you, Alex. And again, it's, uh, you know, I'm glad it finally happened. I love this podcast. Like, I think, uh, you know, you're doing, you're doing something special here. So, yeah, thanks. You can discover more podcast episodes as well as our limited video series on our website, www.releasedayseries.com. And if you'd like to support the show, we've added that option to the website as well. Send us a dollar, three dollars, five dollars, whatever you'd like. Any support helps. But most importantly, we appreciate you listening and sharing the podcast. Mm -hmm.